Last week, we spoke to Clarissa Thomason, author of the six historical nonfiction books, and we heard how the Whitaker family, the first family to settle in Sarasota, Florida, we learned that they received 160 acres of land to homestead, how they settled with the land, the weather, the politics of the time. Few people know about the Whitaker family, maybe because they were poor and didn't leave monuments as markers of their plight, maybe because later generations moved north that the family was forgotten by time. But by intense, dogged, and years of research, Clarissa has been able to glean bits and pieces in order to put their story together. Today, we will talk more about her books. Her books include Defending Hillsboro, Florida Secrets, Florida Shadows, Florida Sunset, Lorinda's Legacy, Reconstructing Hillsboro. And now we'll speak to Clarissa Thomason. Good morning. Do you have a favorite among those? Probably my most favorite is Defending and Reconstructing Hillsboro. And those are the stories of my great great grandparents who ran an inn in Hillsboro, North Carolina. Now, living in Florida, everybody thinks it's Hillsboro County in Tampa, but oh. this is Hillsboro, North Carolina. Uh -huh. And they ran an inn in Hillsboro, North Carolina before and during the Civil War. And my great great grandmother actually saved the inn from Sherman's men at the end of the war when they were set to burn it. She put her daughters in the attic, walled her daughters into the attic to protect them from the soldiers. Wow. Stood up to Sherman's men, who were then going to burn the inn, which, of course, would have been horrible with the daughters up in the attic. And she pulled a marvelous trick to save the inn, and uh, the inn is still there today. I actually had my first book signing at the inn. Ah. Oh. But I did an uh, awful lot of research. It was about five years of research going back and forth to the town because women didn't own property. Mm -hmm. So trying to find any information uh, was very, very difficult. I had to go through the bride's book and the groom's book to find out who was still living and uh, get the information. But I had a great aunt who had done a lot of the family research, which really helped to start that. But those two books were my favorite. Then the Florida Secrets, Shadows, and Sunset are all stories based loosely on my grandmother, who came to Florida before the boom in 1918 uh, to start a new life, and she actually worked at the Gasparilla Inn. My father grew up in the Arcadia, Fort Ogden area, so it's a fun story. I used a lot of leeway on that one. It's not as uh, totally accurate, although the events are. And Lorinda's Legacy is a two-part story of a young woman who's trying to find her grandmother that she was named for, she goes back to the town, which had been the site of the big family feud, and she uh -huh. finds the tragedy is still there. So oh, I see. It's a real page turner. So now, Lucinda, tell us a little bit about her. Lorinda? Or, I'm sorry, Lorinda. Lorinda is based on a 1910 murder trial. She was a relative. She was accused of having helped her boyfriend to murder her father. There was no proof ever. The young man was apparently a uh, ne'er-do-well in town, and they were anxious to pin something on him at last. Mm -hmm. There was no place for women in prisons in 1910. Her uncle, who was her next of kin, claimed that she was mentally deficient and should be put in the mental institution and signed a form. Mm -hmm. So at that time, they kept women in the mental institutions until they were 21 and then did an evaluation and released them. So at age 21, she was released. How to, long was she in this institution? From the time she was 14, 14? until she was 21. Wow. So seven years. So I was able to get the transcript of the murder trial, went through all of the repercussions of that. I have a brother who's a lawyer, and he looked at the trial and said, oh my gosh, it was so trumped up that neither one of them seemed to have really been guilty. But yet the town just wanted to pin the whole thing on somebody. I went through the family feud and the murders, then brought back the granddaughter of the main character looking for her grandmother, trying to find some information on her. Yeah. She found that the tragedy was not really dead yet. It was still waiting. It all comes back to the four years later. Now so, you say this is a two-part story. Two-part. The first part is the original family feud and murder and the second part is the granddaughter, granddaughter, years later, who's looking for her grandmother, and everyone says, don't go back, and she does. And how old is she when she does this? 
probably in her late 40s, early 50s. The granddaughter. Yes, the granddaughter. Oh, my god. Trying to find it. So yeah. It was fun. I had used a lot of leeway with that, but I patterned it on the original transcript. Oh, my gosh. That is exciting. I love it. Have we talked about Florida Sunset? Florida Sunset is the start of <laughs> Venice. It's the same, oh. the same characters, Florida Shadows. It's a young woman coming to Florida to start in Florida Secrets. She's pursued by various unsavory characters and ends up in Ocala. And it takes in the background in Ocala and the buildup of the town there. Then for Florida Sunset, it's the start of Venice. She comes to Venice with the man who then becomes her husband. He is starting up a church in Venice for all of the new settlers coming to the town of Venice. So it brings in all of the startup of Fred Albee and John Nolan and brings in each of the characters. Who were the first people in Venice? Well, it started with Fred Albee, who bought property down in Nokomis. He wanted to build a town down on the waterfront, as did Bertha Palmer. They both had this idea mm -hmm. of building a town down there. Fred Albee was a doctor who had done wonderful things in preventing gangrene and other problems with the soldiers in World War I. He was able to save their limbs, where before that they had just cut the limbs off. Just amputated. Yeah. He was very, very well known as an orthopedic surgeon. He also felt that the area in Venice and Nokomis was the best place in the entire world for health and hours of sunshine and all the things they tell you now in Venice. Uh -huh. Fred Albee believed all of that. So he, was, he bought all this property and was going to build his city. He finally realized he couldn't be an orthopedic surgeon and a city developer at the same time. He sold the property. He had already engaged John Nolan to design the city. John Nolan was an architect out of Connecticut who was a city planner all over the country. He had done a lot of towns. In St. Petersburg was one. San Francisco, he did a lot of work. Several other places around the country. Fred Albee hired him. And then when he decided he couldn't go through with the building of the town, the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers was the largest labor union in the country and wanted a place for their retired railroad officials to come and live and offered to buy the property. They had already contracted to buy property south of Venice, and they offered to buy the rest of it. And Fred Albee said, only if you will keep John Nolan in his plan. So they did. But they started late. They started in 1925, in the fall of 1925. By that time, the Florida land boom on the East Coast was winding down. By the time they got Venice built, in the fall of 1926, there were four different incidents. The railroads went on strike, and the builders could not get enough material to build the homes. So their banks that the builders had made themselves, the banks failed. Mm -hmm. The uh, Prince Valdemar ship sunk in the Miami Harbor and blocked the harbor. Sake. And then a hurricane came through. The hurricane came in overnight at Miami Beach, raged across Lake Okeechobee, and went out at Nokomis. Destroyed almost everything. And, of course, by the time all this news hit the papers up north, Mm -hmm. Everybody said, why would we want to buy in Florida? Yeah. So that was the end of the land boom. Venice, at that point, had just celebrated their opening. They were going to build everything in three years' time. Mm -hmm. They had to turn off the lights in town, and everybody moved out of the town. The start of Venice was very inauspicious. They thought they had such a wonderful town, and it was so beautifully done, and then the bottom fell out of everything. This is the story, and it ends with the hurricane. Oh, my gosh. I'm just sitting here mesmerized. I mean, this is amazing. I've never heard any of these stories. Let's uh, talk a little bit about, I love the Little Green Monkey, and you have a whole series. You have five in your series. Now, why don't you tell us how that started? It started with my daughters. We lived in the Washington, D.C. area, and we didn't have much money, so their favorite place to go was always the zoo, and it was free. And we would pile everybody in the car on a Saturday and go to the zoo. There were tiny little green monkeys that lived in the large animal house. They perched on the hippopotamus's head or on the back <laughs> of the giraffes. And the other animals didn't mind. It was elephants, hippos, rhinos, and giraffes all in this large animal house with these dozens and dozens of these darling little green monkeys that were not more than about six inches high. Six, you know, I didn't even high. know there was such a thing as a little green monkey. Not for real. 
They were, and they were so cute, and my daughters loved them. I got some green flannel and made them little green monkeys that they held. I told stories about mm -hmm. the little green monkeys. <laughs> I was teaching, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to do anything more with them. When the girls got to be teenagers, I threw the stories in the bottom drawer of a dresser and left them. When I retired, shortly after that, I had two grandsons. And I said, oh, they would love these books. I pulled them out and started them up again for my grandsons. It's already two generations. <laughs> right. And then I added more uh, to them. My older grandson found that he couldn't keep up with the other uh, children in school when he was in kindergarten and first grade. Uh -huh. He said to me one day, Grandmommy, I can't run as fast as the other kids and I can't do these things. So I wrote the one about who's a friend. It was all the animals that had been in the large animal house. Mm -hmm. And the little green monkey could not blow water through his trunk like the elephant. That's right. He couldn't run as fast as a giraffe. He couldn't swim in the water like the hippopotamus, but he could stomp in the mud like the rhinoceros. So when he was stomping in the mud, he got covered with mud uh -huh. and then remembered he was supposed to be home for dinner because Grandmommy and Granddaddy Monkey were coming. So the elephant washes him off. The giraffe runs him home fast, uh -huh. and he gets there, and Granddaddy Monkey always questions at the end of the book, what did you learn today? <laughs> and he said, I learned you don't have to like to do the same things to be friends. You just have to like each other. Oh, very good. It has been a wonderful book. And my grandson said to me one time, Grandmommy, why don't you write a book about me? I said, you are the little green monkey. <laughs> so several of the stories really follow along with my grandsons. The last one, Where's Eddie? My grandson had a favorite little stuffed caterpillar that he'd had since he was born. He called it Eddie. And I said to him one day, when is Eddie going to get his wings? <laughs> and he said, oh, never, because he'd fly away and leave me. So the Where's Eddie book starts with Eddie, who's going to get his wings. And the monkey says, don't get your wings because right. you'll fly away and leave me. And he says, no, I'll, um, I'll always come back to see you. At the same time, while I was writing this book, I fell and broke my leg. And I was in a cast from my toes to my hip and lying in bed with my foot in the air, tried to use crutches and tripped and fell and hit my face. So I had a <laughs> bruised face. My daughter brought my grandson over to see me. He came running in and took one look and turned around and ran and <laughs> hid his face in her skirt. So I added Grandmommy to the story, uh -huh. who's sick. The little green monkey comes to bring cookies to Grandmommy, is scared because she doesn't look the same. Mm -hmm. Grandmommy says, it doesn't matter what you look like on the outside, outside it's who you are on the inside that counts yeah. and at that moment the little monkey looks up and here's eddie flapping his wings at the window he says <laughs> a promise is a promise Aww. so it's come back to haunt me several times because my grandson would say grandmommy can we go to mcdonald's this afternoon and i'll say sure and he says remember a promise is a promise <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of been a family project my grandkids have all loved the books i now have two uh, granddaughters who are six and just turning one. The six-year-old would not walk. We waited through 19 months, and she refused to let go of a finger. She would hold on to uh, somebody's finger and walk. Mm -hmm. I make all the kids a set of little the little monkeys, and she was playing on the coffee table with the basket of monkeys, holding on to the one little monkey's hand. And my husband said to her, Natalie, walk over here. She turned around and looked at him and grabbed the monkey's hand, which was about the size of a, fi a finger, uh -huh. and walked all the way across the room. And then she stopped and looked down and realized there was no feet. <laughs> and that was how she learned to walk. So I have a picture of her learning to walk with the little green monkey. Oh, that's adorable. So the, the books have been family favorites, and we, we all relate one way or another to them. Oh, my gosh. This has been wonderful. I can't tell you. I have really enjoyed this. Thank you so much. We've been talking to Clarissa Thomason, a wonderful, wonderful author, not only with her novels, but with her children's collection of books. This is Nancy Busher with Artist Kaleidoscope.